Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest TLC Symposium series from Worth Publishers. Today's topic is how to increase student success by web enhancing your course, featuring Dr. Wendy Bass here. Um, Dr. Bass is a distance education coordinator and project director of the Title V grants at Peer College in Woodland Hills, California. She's taught traditional and online courses in psychology and education at both two and four year schools in California. And in addition to teaching online courses at Pierce, she is responsible for the standards and procedures for online instruction campus wide. She's also a frequent presenter and panelist at education conferences speaking on such topics as best practices in teaching online and how to engage online learners. Um, a few housekeeping issues here before uh, Wendy starts. Um, we we've start, we have started, and this. So if if you are, um, if I guess if you can't hear sound, you can't hear me. But you can call this number to dial in if you are not hearing sound. Um, I did have to mute everybody. I was getting a lot of uh, feedback and background noise. So in order for everybody to enjoy the, the presentation, I have muted people. But we are going to pause uh, to, for questions throughout the discussion. There's also a raise hand icon as well as a chat box, which you could see here. You can uh, click this raised hand or you can t type in this chat box. If you don't see either of these things, um, you should hover over the top of your screen and there should be a green bar which will allow you to bring up this, uh, this box. And if you want to ask a question yourself, uh, use the raise hand icon. And if you want me to ask the question for you, just type it into the box and I'll be sure to do that. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Wendy, uh, the person you really came to hear. And I Hi, everybody. The... Hi, everybody. I'm going to set up share my desktop right now. And we are going to start. So I'm going to go over some real basic things about how to web enhance your classes, why we're web enhancing, the benefits of it and certain things that really help encourage student success when we are talking about putting things online. So the main purpose of this is to talk about how we web enhance traditional courses. And the great thing is once you start web enhancing your traditional courses and you start putting more and more materials online, it actually becomes much easier to think about actually starting to put the course online because you have so many materials online and even starting a flipped classroom. So I always love to start with this. Um, before I can infuse them with the Joy Scholarship, I've got to keep them awake. Which for those of you that have taught 7 to 10 p.m. classes like I have, sometimes you're like out there and you're just seeing how glassy-eyed your students are. They're all coming from long days at work or long days in school. And they're tired. So one of the things I love to do is kind of have do more of the whole flipped classroom thing and have a lot of lectures online and spend the class time doing projects and working in groups so that it's not me trying to keep them awake. So what is a web enhanced course? Because there's a lot of confusion that people feel that the minute you start putting anything online, you may be turning it into a course that is, um, that is no longer web enhanced but is a hybrid or online, and that's not the truth. A web enhanced course is a face-to-face -face course that uses any form of electronic media to post information, deliver content, provide learning resources, foster student interaction outside the classroom, and even though they're web enhanced, they're not replacing any face-to-face -face time with the web enhancement, and that's what keeps it a web enhanced course. When you start replacing the face-to-face -face time with the online component, that's when you're turning it into either a hybrid or an online course. So the technology is basically being used to support the instruction instead of being the sole source of the course delivery. So that's a big thing to be aware of so that you can be putting materials online and even require your students to be logging on to look at those materials. We have something written down in our schedule classes now that actually says that all traditional courses may require students 
to log on and get materials or submit materials online. And we at our college have many open source computer labs that students can access to get to the resources. So students can't use the excuse that they don't have a computer because they have access to, um, they have opportunities to get to any computers to use the um, online components of the course. So why should we web enhance? What's the purpose of it? One is it allows students to access materials 24-7. And that's a big deal for students to be able to access materials 24-7. Many of our students don't even think about getting to studying and sitting down to study until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And that's when most of us instructors are pretty exhausted and getting ready to climb into bed. So we don't want to be available to answer questions then. But students, if you're putting it online, can log on any time of the night or early mornings and find the time to study then. It gives students greater control over their own learning. They have the opportunity to log on when it's convenient for them. Um, with access to traditional materials and online discussions, students have more chances to review course content and practice what they know. And that's a big deal because we have so many different types of learners in our classroom. We have learners that are ready to go faster and learners that need to go slower and then kind of the middle of the road learners. And most of us have, as instructors teach to the middle of the road learners so that we're going at a kind of a medium pace. And so for some of our students that may still be too fast. And for some of our students, it's a little slower. So by putting materials online, we can let students kind of set their own pace. It doesn't mean I'm going to let a student finish my class at a 15-week course in three weeks. I do pace them even online. I don't, put all my, I don't have all my lectures available for the entire semester at the beginning of the semester. I open them up week by week. So I am pacing the students. And for many of us, we can't cover all the material we want to in class. You know, I meet with one of my classes meets once a week for three hours. There's so much more material I'd like I'd love to cover. So my students know that they are still responsible for material that I post online, even if we didn't cover it in the class. Um, many instructors ask me, they say, you know, what happens? Do students just stop showing up in your course then because they can get all the lecture material online, so why bother coming to lectures? And, you know, it's interesting, I did a student orientation a couple weeks ago, we're a week into our semester now, and I actually asked my students, the, it was a generic group of like 50 students, it wasn't my class, it was an orientation to all of our new students, and I said, would you still go to class if all your lectures were online? And 80% of them raised their hand because they want to hear the discussions and they can't just necessarily learn it by looking at it online. I also do something where, even though I put my lectures online, in my class time, I have that the students have to be in class present to get some um, in-class assignment work done. So I have 10 point assignments that have to be done in the class, and they occur 10 times during the semester, and that's 100 points. So if you miss those times, you lose those points, and so there's no way to get an A in my class if you've missed those classes. You can't turn it in late. You have to be in class present to do like the in-class assignment. So that's one of the ways, the incentives I have to keep students coming to class as well. Um, great things about our learning management systems, and LMS stands for learning management systems, and some of you may be familiar with something called a CMS, which is, which is a course management system, and they're used interchangeably. And an example of an LMS would be Moodle or eCollege, Blackboard, Etudes, Desire to Learn, there's a lot, Canvas, there's a lot of them out there, and they all function the same way. It's just which one your college uses is the one that you'll be using. And many of them have calendar features so that when the students log in, it actually tells them when things are due. So, you know, kind of for one of my etudes, it's actually a red flashing thing saying something's due. So a student tell me that they didn't know something was due, I can actually look down and see in an activity meter that a student had been logged on, so I know they saw that red flashing mark that said something was due. So that's kind of helpful for me to actually see kind of their behavior online. Another advantage is when you put testing online, it allows you more opportunities to focus on teaching. I get so bored when I give tests in class and I'm just sitting there and they're taking a test and I'm like, oh, I'd rather be using this time to have discussions and, you know, kind of go in more interesting ways with the students. So one of the things I've done is I put my testing online. And one of the reasons why I did that is so that we can really devote our class time to being in really interesting discussions and talking about more critical thinking activities. 
And so I have them do their testing online. I'm not worrying about cheating per se because to me if they're opening their book to look up the answers, it means they're actually looking in the book. But I also set up um, some timed exams where it's a minute a question. So unless you know the material pretty well, you wouldn't be able to finish in the allocated time. And um, I also have enough questions in there that it pulls from a question pool. So every student is getting a different exam. And every student, they don't have time to be able to print out all the questions if I was worried about them cheating and handing it to someone else because most of our course management systems set it up to where it's one page per question. So if it's a 30 question exam, students aren't going to want to print out 30 pages. And with a minute of question, they also don't have time to do that. So I really like being able to put my testing online and spend more, more of my class time doing other activities. So what are the benefits? So we know why we want to web enhance. Students are more motivated when they have responsibility over their own learning. I am sure that every single one of us has had that experience where a student missed a class and they call you and they're like, so what did we go over in class? And I almost laugh because I'm not going to give a, a three-hour lecture on the phone. So students, if they miss a class, can now take the responsibility and log online and see what the lecture was about. I also um, in the beginning of the semester, I always have a student meet another student and take a phone number so they can call them for information. But um, oftentimes that doesn't work out. The student that they call dropped the class or they don't feel comfortable calling someone that they didn't stay friendly with. So this way it allows the students to log on and be responsible for getting the information they have, may have missed in an exam. Students who learn at different paces can either preview or review materials at their leisure. I really like it when a student can pre-listen to my lecture, and then we can come in and have a great discussion about it, as opposed to me lecturing from the book directly and they haven't read the chapters or done anything. And then it, it's just a, it's me lecturing and there's no going back and forth. I really like more of a discourse and discussions within my classes. Online learning accommodates a variety of learning styles. We have some learners who are auditory, we have some who are kinesthetic learners, we have some that are visual, and you, they all can be accommodated online. I have, um, I have three kids, and one of mine is always standing when he's learning. It's just how he handles it. He stands with one leg down, and in class that doesn't always work, especially now that he's in middle school. And in elementary school, the teachers could accommodate him, and they'd put him in the back so he can kind of stand in the back. But in middle school, there's 45 kids in a small classroom, and he really has to sit there and wiggle around a lot. So I love the fact that if there's stuff online, he can be standing, he can be walking around and still looking at the computer screen. So he's able to still be able to concentrate and hear the auditory part of my of a lecture. So for some of those students, that's really helpful. For other students that really want to be able to listen to the lecture, they can sit there and pause it and play it and pause it and play it and pause it as they want to at their own pace so that you don't have to keep slowing down or speeding up to keep students interested in, a, in an in-class lecture. Um, when you go online with many of your activities, students have an increased opportunities for interaction both inside and outside the classroom. So instead of just meeting three hours a week and seeing each other once a week, they can be in a discussion board within the course management system asking questions, have, building a community with each other, and communicating with each other and you. Um, your commitment as an instructor, you set that commitment to your students. You can say, I log on daily and check for questions. I log on twice a week and check for questions. That's up to you, but that's something you would want to put in your syllabus. I have in my syllabus that when you ask a question, that I'll respond within 24 hours, unless it's a Friday night and weekend, and then I'll respond on Monday mornings. I usually do tend to log in on Saturdays and Sundays, but there's some Saturdays and Sundays I don't want to, and with it in my syllabus, I've put it in a position where I don't have to feel like I need to log in on Saturdays and Sundays if there's questions. I can wait till Monday mornings, and my students know that that's what's in my syllabus, that I will respond on a Monday morning if it's a weekend. Many of our quieter students may feel more comfortable contributing to discussions when they're online. All of us have those students that in the classroom they'll dominate. They'll like ask those questions and keep asking questions and we try to get the quieter students to ask the questions or be part of the discussion. And sometimes it's like pulling teeth. 
But surprisingly, some of those quieter students become really verbal when they go online. And it has to do with the fact that some of them may have English as a second language and they're more shy and they're embarrassed. Well, when they go online, they feel like they can edit what they're writing. So they can write it out and look at it and think about it before they hit post. And, you know, sometimes when you raise your hand, you can blurt something out and, you know, feel embarrassed about it. So a lot of my quieter students become much more verbose when they go online, and I love giving them that opportunity. And there's access to a wider range of media option, which can allow for more complex and deeper understanding. So I embed a lot of videos into my online course. And I think that's really crucial to our students. And I don't have time in my class to always bring in videos. I want to have the discussions, but I can bring those videos into my online course. And I think that is really important, important and crucial. Oftentimes I post, I mentioned that I post my notes beforehand. Students can access those night, notes if they miss the class or they can get the notes before the class so they're more prepared for discussions. And I think that's kind of important. I love seeing their faces of understanding when I'm doing a discussion with them versus those kind of blank faces and I'm like trying to see if they're getting it and trying to see if they're getting it. And, you know, I don't want to spend so much time going over one concept. I'd really like to, to move on. So if they can re, if they can see the notes beforehand, they can be better prepared. This is one of my favorite parts. You can, maybe you're not ready to put tests online, you still want to have them test in person, but you can put practice tests online and allow the students the opportunity to log on and answer questions and take the quizzes and not do it for credit, but just get that experience. And I think that's a really good thing. So many of our students get really nervous about test taking or anxiety, and so it gives them the opportunity to practice it as well as you know, really feel like they're getting knowledgeable and feel more assured when they come into the class to take an exam. So put those practice tests online for them and let them practice. You'd be surprised how many students log on and actually participate even if it's not for credit. So I, I know I do talk kind of quickly because I get so excited about the topic and I want to just kind of give a little stop here and see if there's any questions so far. Um, remember everybody, I did uh, put everybody on mute because of the background noise, but you can communicate with us by clicking the hand raise icon, which will uh, prompt me to take you off of mute to ask your question, or you can type a question into the chat box. And I know it might take you at least a few seconds to chat to type a question, so if you have one, just type a few letters into the chat box so I know to wait for you. Okay, I think we're, we're good to move on. Okay. Hi. Social referencing is when a child is looking to a familiar adult to see how they should react to something. So if they're worried about, like, if something unusual comes into their, their environment, like a gift. So I wanted to show this as an example. I was uh, grading assignments one night, and I was just in bed with my laptop, and I was like, oh, they're all missing this one concept. They're not quite understanding what social referencing is. And I was a little frustrated because I'm like, oh, how do I get them to understand? And this was a fully online class. So I like was like, okay, I think I need to explain it a little better because I'm seeing that so many of them are missing this one specific concept. So I threw on like that gray sweater, and I stood up against the wall, and I handed my husband my phone and said, videotape me right now. So I quickly just explained to my students what social referencing is, and I posted it on, I, what I do with my videos is I upload them to YouTube, and if you notice this video is only like 30 seconds long, so how you can close caption a video is I um, sit there and listen to myself as I'm saying it, and I keep pausing it and I type it out. You upload it to YouTube as a um, text document, and YouTube will match the closed captioning, what your text file to your mouth movements, and it's closed captioned. And later on, I'll actually show you the closed captioning that comes with it, because this one, it didn't upload into my um, keynote presentation. 
But I think that's important. Um, some instructors don't like to put videos of themselves on, but I am just like, they're homemade. You can see they're homemade, and the students really appreciate it that they're given an opportunity to kind of hear my voice and hear like what concepts they're having some issues with. So I would say add a video of yourself. I do that all the time, and I'm going to show you like where I do that. And then the other thing I do is I change pictures often. I make it kind of fun to log into the online environment. So every week I, I upload different photos and different pictures, and I try to make them funny. And one of the great things about teaching in the psychology or child development or education areas, I can upload pictures of kids doing really silly things. And some people have asked me about copyright laws. So one thing I always recommend is I, when I do a search on Google, I'll search um, open source photos. Or Flickr has an open source account where people have uploaded photos that are open source that you can use. And it's very easy to put those right into your URL, um, into your, um, your course management system. So I just think it's kind of fun. It makes it more fun for me to log in to have different pictures as well. Sometimes there's a picture, sometimes there's going to be a video of me doing an update. Um, it kind of changes all the time, so it makes it a little more fun for the students. I also try to do some fun things with my students. I want to build more community. so. Um, Every fall when there's Thanksgiving, I have my students do something and say we're going to do a Thanksgiving party. And there's a website called faceandhole.com. So I send my students to it. This is optional. It is not mandatory. I don't grade it. But you can upload silly photos and they'll, you can embed it into like a turkey. Like mine is right there. I know it's silly. But sometimes part of being a teacher is, you know, the ability to kind of make fun of yourself or have fun. And I was surprised out of a class of 40 students, 30 students took the time to go to Face and Hole and upload silly photos of themselves. And it was really fun. It was community building. We enjoyed it. And that it was not for credit. It was just for fun. And I do think it's nice to be able to build community online as well as in the classroom. And one thing we need to be aware of is our students coming in now tend to be much more comfortable on the Internet than we ever were. I mean, I have kids of varying ages, and I, we were laughing about it last night, is that my 15-year-old would not be considered a native computer person. We didn't, he didn't grow up with the iPad and the computer and DVRs. I actually was laughing with him. I'm like, you had a VHS, and you had to watch whatever episode was next in a row because we just taped a bunch of shows at a time for you. And Versus my youngest one, who's eight now, is so conditioned to go on Netflix and watch whatever show he wants or DVR. So our, as the kids are growing older, they're more and more comfortable with technology versus my older students I tend to be a little more um, gentle with them and teaching them how to log on and we'll all go to the computer lab together so but they enjoy being online so one of the things I try to do is I try to have discussions that are relevant that aren't necessarily graded so many of our students are all about being you know do I get graded for this do I get graded for this and I want us to have discussions that are you know robust and aren't always about like what your grade is going to be. I want it to be about encouraging critical thinking. So I will add, like we'll do discussions on like spanking. I have this great video about breastfeeding seven-year-olds and I'll ask them, what's your opinion about this? ADHD treatments, Tiger Mom when that book came out last year, the HPV vaccine, is it good, is it not? There's a lot of controversy about giving it to boys now. These are all great things that are kind of relevant to here and now. And I'm always amazed at how many students will start participating in these discussions and they're not graded. And I think they look for opportunities just to share too. And this is about opinions. It's not about like you must bring in the book to reference it. This is really about us having robust discussions on areas that concern child development or psychology depending on which course I'm teaching. Controversial videos, those are great. I use a lot of videos. I use them for sharing information. I do one-minute updates like, hey, everybody, um, if I'm away, I, a couple years ago I was given an opportunity to go on an event called March of the Living, and I chaperoned students going to Poland and Israel with um, eight Holocaust survivors, and it was an amazing opportunity. I was the media person for it. So I was posting things to my students, like, hey, this is where we are, this is what we're learning, and so and I was giving them updates as I was going. It wasn't necessarily specific to the class, but I thought it was relevant information to share to them. I'm teaching moments. I can take something that I saw in the classroom where I could see they wanted to go deeper, but I didn't have time to go deeper, and move it into the online discussion so that we can continue it. 
funny, just posting some funny videos and sharing them and having them discuss it. And then there's a lot of current events we can add as well, you know, especially with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, gun control, that's going on now, teacher fears. When we had the whole Sandy Hook shooting, I, um, I was, you know, we had really relevant discussions. How do you talk to the students about it? Suddenly, even though I'm in Los Angeles where, um, where I'm located, it didn't happen here, but at every single one of our schools, there were suddenly police cars and there were police presence. So how do you talk to the students about that? That came, became a really relevant discussion. It wasn't graded. It wasn't part of what you know, we were teaching, but it was a timely thing that we wanted to discuss. That was a wonderful thing to be able to put online. School safety, child care issues. So those are all really great topics to bring in, but you also don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to always come up with a brand new topic. So one of the things I do is I have I make very generic videos so that maybe the first semester I'm creating the videos, it may take a little more time, but I make them generic enough that I can use them you know, year after year or semester after semester. So a video, I, I made one generic video on taking an online course, what my expectation is for the students, that I don't want them using the small I's or using texting language, I want them to spell it all out. So I do that where I um, make it generic so I don't say what semester it is. Recycle your videos. So I have one at the very end of the semester saying, you know, this was a great semester. I hope you learned a lot. I'm going to have everything graded by Friday. I don't say which Friday. I don't say whether it's a Friday in December or a Friday in June. I just say by Friday, and then I tell them to have a wonderful break because they're either going to winter break or summer break. So I can use the exact same video semester after semester. So, you know, don't like feel like, oh, my God, I've got to do this every semester. I house them all on YouTube. And I, um, I house them all on YouTube, and then I throw them, um, I embed them into my class. Now, this is a really important thing. Why do you think I embed them in my class? And the reason for that is because students, once you send them out to YouTube, get very distracted. I mean, I admit I can get really distracted. So when I'm watching a class video on YouTube, what might happen is I see, oh, wait, there's this really cute video of like a dog skateboarding, or oh, there's a new SNL skit I didn't get a chance to watch. So I end up getting distracted and start watching all those other videos. So if you are using videos, I want to tell you definitely you want to bring them into your course so that they're, you're not linking them out. And I'll show you where you get the embed code in a little bit. You want to use the publisher's resources but personalize them. You know, many of our publishers give great resources that come with the textbooks. I happen to use Berger for my um, CD1 book, and it's amazing all the resources I can get. Coming up with the quest weekly discussion questions, I can pull them right from discussion, um, the publisher's suggestions for questions, and even videos, I link those videos, I pull the, put them right into my class. They'll give you a zip drive that you can upload into your course management system, which is exactly what I did. And um, also their PowerPoints. Why? remake PowerPoints. I take their PowerPoints and I add the audio to them. So once again, using the publisher's PowerPoints, I add the audio, but it's important that you make them ADA compliant. And by doing that, I add the transcripts. And I let the students know that the transcripts are available upon request. And that's really important because we want to make sure that anything we put online, students with any kind of visual or hearing or any other deficit, um, disabilities are able to still be enrolled in our course and get the same value of the material they're getting. Um, so my publishers, when I use the Burger book, the PowerPoints actually came with notes at the bottom. So what I did is copy and pasted all those notes to a single document, and that's what I'm actually reading when I'm adding the audio to the PowerPoints, and then I upload that to YouTube and embed it back. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes how it works. And like I said, I'm using the publisher's transcript, so I don't have to type up everything that I, I said. And post to YouTube and embed in your course. I've tried to post to other um, servers. In the past, I had MobileMe, and I could post to that and embed it in my course. But then MobileMe stopped giving us that um, space, and I had to start paying for it. So I have a, um, a Pierce College YouTube account where I post to, and most of my instructors post to, and we link our students from that account. So. Um, it, YouTube makes it very easy to use the resources. 
So this is a picture of what it looks like in my course. And I always have down for every single chapter, below is the PowerPoint presentation with my audio to the presentation. If you would like an audio transcript of the presentation, please send me an email requesting this. I don't automatically upload it for each student. I just ask them. And I've had students specifically request it. And I'm going to take you right now to my course so I can show you where I have it. So you're going to see we're actually in one of my courses right now. And I just link to it. Here's my, I give them either a PowerPoint or I give them a PowerPoint with audio. And I want to make sure to qualify because this question has arisen. What if your students don't have PowerPoint? How, you know, do we have to make sure that they all buy it and have it on their computer? And the answer to that question is no. What I do is I save all my PowerPoints or keynotes as PDFs and upload them that way. And if they're uploaded that way, a student can open them on any device. They can open it on their phone or on any computer or tablet. So that's my recommendation is just to save it as a, as a PDF and upload it that way. And I do that actually with everything. I never have um, Microsoft Word documents because what if they're using another Word, an older Word version? That way we don't have to worry if they're compatible or not. I always have them save it. I always save it as a PDF. So here's a PowerPoint with audio. And I'm just going to... Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about Chapter 9, which is about um, cognitive development and early childhood um, education. So we always start with fact or fiction, and the first one is pre-operational intelligence is symbolic and self-centered, and this is actually true. Number two, a so as you can see, it's embedded right into the course, so I never sent the student away from the course. They're still in the course and they're watching it. It doesn't matter what kind of program they have or wh whether they have QuickTime or not. Because it's a YouTube video, I can embed, take the embed code and put it right into my course, and they can watch it. They can also take notes now. I mean, I know that you guys are already aware, I talk kind of quickly. And so they can hit play Three year olds likely to, to believe it. And they can pause it when they want to and take notes any, as much as they need to. So it's giving them the ability to speed me up or slow me down as much as they need to. And I think that's putting a lot of learning in the students' hands. So I think that's important for them to have that opportunity. Some students don't want to listen to me, so I actually upload the PowerPoints without audio. So I give them that option to either listen to me or not listen to me. Um, it's their preference. And then I have... Down here, you can see there's a lot of videos. These came straight from the publishers. I can clip, click on it. And here it is. And it has, comes with close, the great things about the ones coming from the publishers tell me what is they have closed captioning on? already included in them. Take and what up? So we don't need to watch those. But I just wanted to give you guys that opportunity to see what you what comes with the publishers that you can embed right into your course as well. Hold on a second, I'm going back to this. So, one of the most important things is we want to get our students comfortable in the online environment. So one of the first things I do is I have them do a little syllabus quiz. It's on really basic questions. It's on like where is my office? When are my office hours? Do I accept late work? Um, when is everything due? Because in my classes, I have everything due on Tuesday nights at 11 p.m. So any student that said I didn't know something was due Tuesday night at 11 p.m., I know that they already took the syllabus quiz and they somehow passed that question, so they need to know that. And then what I do is within the syllabus quiz, they have to actually get a, use a password to get into the syllabus quiz. So as you can see, I have it circled in bright green. It says the first quiz on the syllabus is on the syllabus and requires the password infants in order to enter, enter it. This is in my actual syllabus. So they need to actually log in, read my syllabus, and be able to find that password in order to go in and actually take the syllabus quiz. It's worth five points. You can make them worth 10 points. But it's a great way to get them comfortable in the online environment, especially if you're going to do testing online. It's a basic way to get them, okay, this is where the testing tool is, and this is how I enter it, and this is how I take a test online. So it's a, it's a great way to introduce them. So it, it gives them an opportunity to try your system's quiz tool. And it basically allows you to see that a student is present and active before census week. I'm not sure if all your schools have census week, but for um, – as in California, it's a big deal that before census week, we have to prove that a student is active and participating in class because there's been some issues with financial aid fraud. So what we do is we have to have them in, you know, input assignments. 
So my students have to do the syllabus quiz and go into discussions and introduce themselves in order for me to see that they're present in the class and that I'm not going to drop them. Just showing up does not constitute being present in the class. I want to think they're going to be active because oftentimes they show up but they're still class shopping and they may not stay active. I know I'm going pretty quickly. Are there any questions so far? I don't see any questions right now in the chat box or any raised hands. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to type them in the chat box. Again, um, I know you can't type them up with you know really quickly, so if you're about to write something, just put a couple letters in the chat box so I know to wait for you. And if anyone is having trouble finding that chat box, if you hover over the top of your screen, you should see a little tab, and then there will be an icon that says chat. Um, I can't, for some reason, it doesn't let me show it on the computer. It's hidden um, from, you know, showing people, but it's up there. And, okay, so uh, one of the attendees is in the process of typing a question. Okay, how do you convert PowerPoint PDF into YouTube videos? That is a great question. I happen to, I, I'm a Mac user. I don't know if you can tell by my screen, but I tend to be a Mac user. And so I use Keynote, not PowerPoint. And Keynote allows me to add, um, I'll kind of show you right here. I can actually add um, record slideshow. If you can see that, and so I throw on a microphone to my, um, I just plug it into the back of my computer and record slideshow and just speak as I go and then once the slideshow is report, recorded I can export it right there as a um, as a PowerPoint or QuickTime video and upload it to YouTube so it makes it pretty easy to do I'm pretty PowerPoint sure that there's an op I'm pretty sure there's an option to do that in PowerPoint as well um, I could look up instructions and send it to you, at least in the later versions of PowerPoint. I think you're right. I had a harder time with PowerPoint because you had to click the micro microphone to get it to play, and I wanted to send it directly as a, like to turn it into a video as opposed to having them download it and have to click the microphone. But I think there's a newer version of PowerPoint than when I was doing it that would allow the same thing. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like we have another question coming in. Okay, I'm going to take her off of mute so she can ask it. Okay, hi. Um, I was wondering, during the Don't Reinvent the Wheel section, you had a good tip about um, it, it just sounded like a good idea for, for something that instructors should know how to do. And I didn't know if you had any other top tips for the instructors that are sort of hesitant to get involved that would be, you know, the, the most impactful things for students that are relatively easy for the instructors to implement. So basically the biggest thing to me is like take their public take the publisher's powerpoints and add your video to, your audio to them and I weed them out. I don't like you know you can personalize it. Take their stuff and absolutely personalize it to who you are. So I don't cuz I don't want any audio to be longer than 10 minutes. I think I'll lose the students. Like, I would lose me. So I do think that's crucial. Um, later on I'm going to go over it, but I use cheat sheets in terms of giving feedback to students. The first time I give feedback, one of the things I do is I create, I open up a Word document and I, I'm typing up comments to students and I copy and paste them into a Word document so that as I'm giving feedback to students, I can reuse some of the same feedback because so many of the students have the same issues and I don't want to retype it every single time. So copying and pasting it is a great way to um, reuse comments and not be so time intensive for you as you're giving feedback to students. Thank you. I have another question about your YouTube account. Do you keep the videos private and then embed the private link or are they public? 
I have to keep them public because if you could put them private, I, the private link doesn't work for me. So I'm going to take you guys to YouTube right now, and you're going to see that this is our YouTube thing. And um, here, all there's my burger chapter three, there's my chapter one, chapter two, chapter sixteen. So you can see I have them all there. I, you know, I'm happy if people want to share my resources. If they really like my lecture, I'm happy to have them listen to my lectures. And then here's me doing some like, you know, basic little things where I'm saying things. Um, like, you know, these are social referencing or CD1 or this is me doing a closing. Hi, everybody. It is Wendy. It is the end of the semester, and I just wanted to say that it was a wonderful semester. I loved answering all of your questions, and I hope that you guys feel like you learned a lot. Um, I am hoping to have everything graded and all set by Friday night, so definitely log on, and you should be able to see your grade then. And um, looking forward to hopefully meeting you guys in person, and good luck with all of your future endeavors in um, child development. Thanks. Bye. So as you can just see by that video, it was closed captioned, so I uploaded the text to it, and it was so generic. I can use that exact same video every semester. I never said what, what semester it was, and just wish them good luck. And what I can do is, if I want to share it, I can click share. So if, hopefully you guys can see my screen. I click share. And once you click share, you have an option to share video, embed, or email. You can click embed, and that gives you the code that you're going to then put back into your course shell. And that's the code that embeds it into your course so that you don't have to take them out of your course to send them to YouTube. I'm going to go back on to um, this. I want to make sure to clarify, so many of us are using different course management systems. And we may assume that it seems logical where everything is located in it, but it may not be logical to our students. So I always say that whichever course management system you're using, create a screenshot like the one I'm showing you and explain to the students where everything is. Assignments, obviously, we're all assignments where it will be located and submitted. Chats is where I actually hold my um, Tuesday night office hour, so you click on it and you enter a, ch a live chat. Forums to me is one of the most confusing ones. For Moodle, they call it forums, and that's actually discussions. So I have to let the students know that they have to go into the forums area to get to discussions. My other course management system, Etudes, is called discussions. So you do need to make sure students are aware. Um, hot potatoes are weekly crosswords. I have my students do um, crossword puzzles every single week. It's really fun for them. They can, um, it's a glossary of the terms. I go to the end of every chapter. So chapter one at the very end, there's glossary of terms. And I just write down those and, and then write down the definitions and the students get credit. They're 10 points each and they add up and they can use their book. But I'm thrilled that they're opening the book and they're looking up the answers because I get so frustrated at the end of the semester when I see that students come in and their book has no crease in it, meaning that they haven't opened the book basically all semester. Or if they did, it was so little it didn't get a crease mark. And then our school is fortunate enough to have something called Turnitin, which is a plagiarism software, and it integrates with, our, um, with Moodle, which is our course management system. So students can actually submit it through Turnitin through Moodle, and many of my instructors use that. I want to mention the flipped classrooms because these are getting much more popular. Um, what a flipped classroom actually is is students watch lectures at home at their own pace and they communicate with their peers and teacher via the online discussions. So the flipped classrooms are using a course management system. They're not just generically on the web. And then what happens is concept engagement takes place in the classroom and it's facilitated by the instructor. So you're spending the class time working with students on the knowledge they're getting already. So you're not spending three hours lecturing to the students. They should have watched the lecture before they came into class so that the class is spent on other things, working on projects, group work, doing discussions, and so that it really opens up that class time so that you don't feel like it's all about you lecturing and the students listening. And this is a theoretical framework for flipped classrooms. And so far, the early research is showing that student success is higher in flipped classrooms because they're being able to apply the information that they're learning. They're actually learning through activities, not just being lectured to and then spitting it back out on a test. They are listening to the lecture at home and then doing the project in the class with the instructor there. And the benefits of a flipped classroom Students can listen to lectures at their own pace. You guys, I showed you an example already how they, you can pause, play, pause, play, and really listen to it at your own pace. 
it really leaves the classroom time for collaborative work and, you know, mastering the concepts. And one of the biggest components to me to teaching online is online discussions. And what's really important is that you have clear directions on what signifies participation. Because some students might log on and say, I agree with this, and wonder why they're not getting the good grade or why their discussion isn't, you know, wait, wait a second, what's going on? You want clear examples of where the discussions are located. So I showed you, like, this is where it is. And you can have practice opportunities via introductions. So I have all my students log on and say, hello, this is who I am. And I actually give them a personal response back. And then I know that they know how to get into the discussions area and post something. And then what's really important is to have a copy of your grading rubric so students understand the expectations. So I'm going to show you really quickly a copy of my grading rubric. This is my newest grading rubric. I'm using it for the first time this semester. I'm, I decided to go without testing. I, this is a, I, I, you know, change up my teaching all the time. So this semester I decided to do no tests but do a discussion every single week, which is worth 20 points. And we have 15 discussions. So our discussions are worth like 300 points. They are the meat of the class. And basically I'm saying that you have to log on. Um, within three days of posting, my posting the question, you have to respond, and then you have to respond to a classmate, and I'm explaining to them that I'm grading them on critical thinking, and uniqueness, timeliness, quantity, and kind of stylistically how they're doing it. And stylistically has to do with like the grammar and the spelling, and they are automatically will get zero points on stylistic if there's any texting language used. And as I'm giving them feedback on their introductions, because school started a week ago, so now I've been giving them um, comments on the introductions that they did for the class. Many of them did lowercase i's or wrote in texting language. I've already said to them, I just want to make sure I'm giving you credit on this now, but when it comes to responding to the discussion questions, make sure that you write in regular full sentences and don't use texting language. And I actually tell them all, I recommend you write it in a Word document first. You can check for grammar and spelling, and then copy and paste it into the um, discussion box. So that way, you've been able to kind of proofread it before you post it. When you're doing the online discussion, you want to make sure the topic's interesting and relevant. Um, you want to encourage timely participation so they get points. That's part of the rubric that they submit in a timely fashion. You want to make sure the questions you're asking are open-ended, because if you ask questions like, um, did you like this? It's a yes, no. So it would be very hard for them to be able to, like, you know, support it with material from the book and all that stuff. And give choices. I actually give at least two questions per week so they could choose which one they want to respond to. For me as an instructor, it's a little more interesting to grade so they're not all, I'm not grading the exact same question. And for the students, many, you know, everyone likes to have choices. So it allows them to feel a little more empowered that they could choose which one to respond to. And make sure you create a safe environment. Talk about what your expectations are in terms of respecting each other and what they're doing. So I want to show you my syllabus in my, one of my online classes. And within my syllabus, one of the things I have down is I have web, web etiquette, so like web discussion board etiquette. And I have that being respectful to your fellow classmates. I have don't write in all capitals. You would, we think that our student knows our students know that rule that like writing in all capitals is considered shouting, but some of them don't, so I put that in writing. I have don't belittle any of your classmates, and everyone's entitled to their own idea, and it's okay to disagree in a constructive way. And I think that's important. We're really giving them, we're teaching them how to be online. So maybe our students are used to texting, and they don't always realize how something might sound in writing versus, you know, even verbally seeing it. Or, you know, when you're being sarcastic to someone in person, they can see your face and see you're, see you're being sarcastic. But online, being sarcastic doesn't always work. It can be really hurtful. I have um, how you post a message to a topic is just as important what you post. So we want to make sure that your behavior um, follows course etiquette. And one of the things I make sure to let the students know, is, and all of you have this ability, when you're in this instructor in your CMS or LMS, you have the ability to delete a comment. So if you see something really inappropriate, you can delete it before other students read it. Um, readness or slamming won't be tolerated. That's important for students to be aware of. And just being respectful. Um, so that's 
to me a real crucial moment. And I feel like I'm teaching students how to be online, and that's a big skill to have because so many of us get emails all the time on a daily basis from colleagues, and sometimes I'm like oh, taken aback by how rude they are, and I realize they don't realize how rude they are. I um, sometimes have to, like I'll be upset when I get an email and I'll write it and I'll put it in the draft box and the next day I read it and I'm like, oh, it's a good thing I didn't send that, and I'll kind of censor myself when I'm not as angry and send it sounding a little better. So that's really important to offer that to our students to kind of help them to do that. Sorry, we're going through this one again. Let me move on to the next one. This is just a, the last one. Was just an, uh, this is my rate, just an example of using grading rubrics. Depending on your course management system, um, Moodle allows me just to click on which box they're in and gives them the points for me. Some of them don't, and I have to add them up myself. So it depends on which uh, course management system. So here's some online teaching shortcuts, which I kind of went through already. I'm a cheat sheet for comments. You use the last year's comments or last semester's comments, so have a Word document open with comments you've already used when you're grading that assignment so that you can reuse them. Give yourself time to grade. I mean, all of us, that's one of the hardest things about teaching is finding the time to grade. I, you know, so I kind of treat myself. I kind of leave my office and I leave home and I run over to Starbucks and I get myself that Frappuccino once a week when I have to sit down and grade. And I sit down and grade with my free Wi-Fi and, because I get too distracted otherwise. At home, there's the laundry, at work, the phone doesn't stop ringing. So I, I, it really is a good way for me to go somewhere else and sit down and grade. Oftentimes, I use student-created content. Um, depending on the semester, I allow them to do some extra credit. So I ask them to pick one concept that they really want to focus on and create a PowerPoint presentation on that concept. And it's amazing to me because some of our students are so tech savvy. They create some really fancy presentations. They upload them to a site called SlideShare. And that, then they embed it back into the course so that they, and I have it where they have it open so all the other students can actually view it and learn from it. And I ask them if I can use those PowerPoints so I can embed their PowerPoints into future lectures. So it's a great time-saving technique and I have these amazing ways to share information. And another online shortcut is just don't reinvent material. Use publisher material, but you can personalize it to your course. Blogging is getting really popular. Um, it's a web blog, which is a term used to describe websites that maintain an ongoing chronicle of information. Sorry, there's a misspelling there. And that's a great feature. A lot of our students love blogging and something that they love to do. You can have students blog in the LMS or you can have them blog in an outside one. And that's just a site to, um, that talks about the ten, top 10 sites for blogging, which are the best ones. I tried blogging last year in my LMS, but the way my LMS worked, I couldn't set it up properly and it took me probably hours and hours and hours to get them even set up to have them blogging, and I found it pretty frustrating. So I decided to not do it now until the blogging feature for my LMS gets a little better, but my English instructors swear by blogging. They love it because they have the students blog every week on their readings, and they say that's just a wonderful feature in terms of having the, seeing it, what the students are retaining as they um, are reading the material. And this is my favorite slide to end with. Well, there goes another school teacher who makes 10 million bucks a year. Meanwhile, I'm working my butt off playing professional hoops and I can barely pay my rent. Because we all know how much work it is to be a teacher. And, you know, if you can use some of the shortcuts to help you along, it's great. So, I mean, the first time you set up web enhancing, it's going to be a little more extra work. But then you can use the same material semester after semester. So you want to make sure to use it make it as generic as possible. Obviously, I'll have to up update my um, audios of my PowerPoints as we get new additions and as new information comes in. But, you know, with generic information like social referencing, that one video you saw, that's not going to change that definition. I can keep using that definition year, you know, semester after semester. I know I talked pretty quickly and I've gone over a lot of material, but we have about five minutes left, so I want to make sure to have time if there's any more questions. I don't see uh, any questions in the chat box or any raised hands. Um, you all know the drill. If you have a question, raise your hand or type a few letters into the chat box so I know that you're about to send a question. I don't, um, I don't see anything. I'm going to go so I back. can show some other features then. One of the things I would love to show is um, 
so I create a crossword for each semester, for each per, for each week, and then I also do something called a discussion where they have to like talk about like this week happens to be cognitive development, so they're talking about Piaget versus the Vygotsky, and I give them some different options with that one. And then one of the things I did is I, I do some, a lot of homegrown videos. I think that it's really important to do homegrown videos. I think that students really benefit from them. Um, it's okay, and you know I have this ability. So I happen to have three kids, so I had gone to a video and I was, I'd gone to a presentation and they were like, oh, just use your own kids, this videotape at home, it's great. So I did, I found that my students weren't quite understanding the conservation task. So I did, this was from 2009, the same child 2010, the same child 2011, and the same child 2012, because it took my youngest four years to show that he understood conservation. And I was able to demonstrate that to my students and they can see in my lecture all four years of the same kid. And then I was able, the first year I did it, I had only had the one year of Ari, my youngest. So the next, at that same time, I happened to have one that was in the concrete operational stage, so I showed him. And then the next one is some, one of my ones that's in the formal operational stage, so I could show the kids how they can do it, um, how they can demonstrate concepts to uh, do that. I have a very close friend at work here who just had a very a baby who is so social, and I'm, I'm like stealing all her videos of the baby. Because back when I had my kids, the videos on our, we didn't even have video phones. So now I have all these great videos of him laughing, and I can demonstrate lots of different concepts. And I'm like, okay, try this with them and videotape it for me. So it's really easy to embed the videos into your classes and use them to really demonstrate concepts to your students. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else you guys would like to see. I have, um, oh, I know what I can show you. On YouTube, it's interesting, YouTube actually will put a transcript for you, even though I added closed captioning. If you look on my screen, it says shows transcript. They actually, here you go, inside here is the um, I love answering all of your questions. Here is a transcript, and it, I didn't even ask them to do it. So YouTube will actually add the transcripts for you. It's just kind of an automatic thing. You still want to double check them and make sure they're accurate because they may not be completely accurate and you can fix them. So any uh, final questions? I don't, um, I don't see any questions in the chat box or any hands raised. So, um, getting my, my slides back on the screen. I just want to say thank you for, for joining us. And, and uh, Dr. Best, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I'm sure everyone has learned a lot about web, en web enhancing their course. I will be um, posting uh, a recording of this presentation to Faculty Lounge. Um, I also will send you an email with that information. And Faculty Lounge is our online site where professors can go to share teaching materials. If you go in there, um, there's a whole bunch of different things you could use in the classroom organized by topic, as well as uh, recordings from all of our previous symposia. So thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Bass, and this was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, bye.